Can you start the, this? We are still in practice session. Hello and good morning, everyone. We are in the fifth day of the EU India People Summit. My name is Dr. Ritamra Manavi, and I'm joined here with my team and our esteemed guests. Today, we are going to talk as our very first panel on the migrant journeys and the need for social security nets uh, in a post pandemic world. Hopefully we will be able to achieve it in coming time. And uh, without, uh, without much ado, I would like to introduce our guest speakers for this panel today. I have with me Dr. Pia Overoy. Pia is currently Senior Advisor on Migration and Human Rights for Asia Pacific, uh, based in Bangkok, uh, Office of the United Nations Human Rights, is responsible for developing and implementing research and policy on migration and human rights in the region. Previous to this function, she was the head of global migration team at OHCHR, where she headed the office's global work on policy and legal issues related to human rights of all migrants and the intersections be between migration and human rights. Before that, she led the immigrants' rights-related work of Amnesty International's International Secretary and has been an expert consultant for NGOs and policy think tanks in Asia Pacific region and around the world. Pia has published and lectured extensively on migration and human rights issues and holds a DPhil in international relations from St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. Welcome, Pia. Then I also have with me Natasha Badwar. She's an Indian author, columnist, filmmaker, journalist, and media trainer. She has written the books, My Daughter's Mom and Immortal for a Moment. Badwar started her career in broadcast journalism with NDTV. She worked with NDTV for almost 13 years. And as journalist, she covered the 2002 Gujarat riots. She's also associated to Karwan e Mohabbat, the caravan of love, which actively helped migrants and their families during the lockdown in March 2020. Finally, with me, I have Mansi Parpiani. Dr. Mansi is a research lead at the Center for Migration and Labor Solutions. She uh, uh, team at Ajivika. Mansi's research at Ajivika has focused on occupational safety among migrant workers in small manufacturing factories in Mumbai. She was also part of a rapid assessment study with Indian Institute of Human Settlement and commissioned by ILO on impact of COVID-19 lockdowns on workers' fundamental rights <coughs> of work and livelihood. Sorry. She has a master's from the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, and PhD from University of Copenhagen. Her doctoral thesis focused on precariousness and competitiveness in informal urban work and outlined the challenges of entry into the labor, labor market for, faced by migrants in Mumbai. Prior to this, she worked on a project of documenting the single woman migration of domestic workers from Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand to Mumbai and was Asiatic Society of Mumbai's Labor Study Fellow from 2014 and 15. Welcome, Mansi. So to start this discussion, my first question is to Natasha. And I wanted to start straight up from, uh, I hope we still have Natasha with us, right? Yes. And I wanted to start straight, uh, straight up from the point where we saw a massive amount of migration flow happening in India. Uh, in the March of 2020, after the lockdown was announced and the government of India said that we did not even know how many migrant workers are there in the city. So Natasha, can you walk us through what happened at that point in time, logistically, as well as from the government side and what you saw on the field as a visual journalist, please. Thank you, thank you, Ritambra. Um, it's a little surreal, actually, um, sitting here to recount uh, what we experienced last year uh, when the, the deluge of migration began from Indian cities, um, leading to people walking thousands and thousands of kilometers with their belongings uh, in their hand, with their children on their hip, with their elderly um, on makeshift trolleys that they were pulling along the highways of this country. I say surreal because the same people, uh, they have our phone numbers stored in their 
uh, phones are calling us again one year later because uh, the second wave has triggered a very similar hunger crisis, not only a crisis or medical crisis of uh, you know, uh, uh, gigantic proportions as the world is watching, uh, but also a crisis uh, of livelihood, of hunger, and of extreme deprivation. Uh, because as city after city goes under lockdown, and as the threat of a countrywide lockdown looms, uh, people have um, they have lost uh, their jobs, uh, factories and offices have shut down, transportation has shut down. So those who were commuting locally are out of work all over again. And they have begun to make calls to the only people they were able to get some relief from. And, uh, you know, so because the Karwani Mohabbat, um, just to give you a little idea, the Karwani Mohabbat is a group of volunteers and organizations, it's, it's, it's a platform that uh, came together uh, around in 2017 to respond to the rise of hate crimes in India that were not being seen as interconnected with each other. Um, so we, we came together, Harsh Mandar gave a call um, and a lot of writers, filmmakers, volunteers, uh, young people, students came together because we all felt uh, intuitively and uh, on the basis of the evidence that was in front of our eyes that there was a pattern uh, to the lynchings and the hate crimes that had begun to be reported from across the country. Uh, we were focusing on that when uh, the NRC results uh, were announced in Assam. Uh, soon after that, the CAA was announced. There was a nationwide anti-CAA a protest movement, uh, which led to violence in Delhi in the, in the last week of February, which within a few weeks, as we were scrambling to respond uh, and provide some kind of relief and rescue to the victims of violence in New Delhi, uh, the countrywide lockdown was announced and uh, all hell broke loose, literally. Uh, you know, within three days of the announcement of the lockdown, um, uh, you know, volunteers of Karwani Mohabbat, of organizations such as Aman Biradri, had already been working uh, with the homeless in India, uh, in, 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 across India and in Delhi. And uh, three days later, a small team of people went to North uh, Delhi to uh, get an assessment of how the homeless were faring now that all daily wage work had stopped. And all the, you know, the small um, eateries where they would get their two meals a day, all the temples and gurdwaras where they would eat uh, the charity meals uh, had been shut down. And where we would on an average day have found two or 3,000 people uh, or, or maybe even less, there were uh, over 10,000 uh, men, women, and children um, sitting in, you know, completely desperate uh, and hungry. And these were not homeless people. These were the working uh, class of Delhi, some of, many of whom lived in their workplaces, which had shut down. So suddenly overnight, uh, they were on the streets. The places where they could have uh, found food or bought food, those were shut down. They did not have homes uh, equipped with kitchens and pantries that would have a month's uh, you know, supply of ration. And the, the, the first people that we interviewed, so a media team, a small media team and a group of volunteers went to distribute food on day one. And the interviews that came uh, back to us on, on the first day were people cons you know, consistently uh, recounting, I am not poor, I am not homeless. I have never begged for food before and uh, breaking down because they had not eaten for uh, you know, a couple of days. They did not know where their next meal was going to come from. And, um, and of course that triggered first a uh, week long of uh, a hunger crisis, which eventually uh, within a week, 10 days, we began to see people just take to the roads. 
they began to walk. Uh, you know, there, there was no deadline to the uh, lockdown. There were rumors that this lockdown could last for months altogether. Um, most of the migrant labor uh, in the cities, they, I mean, almost all of them, they come from uh, districts from, uh, you know, various states across. I mean, there's so much cross migration. There were people in Rajasthan from Jharkhand. There were people in Jharkhand from Rajasthan, uh, people from the south in Orissa. You know, there, there were just, all of these people needed to crisscross uh, people working in Pune and Goa and Bombay who needed to return to Bihar, those who were working in Calcutta who needed to return to Maharashtra. And we began to see visuals uh, largely reported by India's independent media um, and independent journalists of uh, people who had simply begun to walk on the highways. And I remember again the, on the first few days uh, citizens would drive out in their own cars, uh, risking, uh, you know, police uh, action against them to offer some kind of uh, food relief. So there were people distributing biscuits, water, um, you know, small packets of uh, dry uh, food, etc. And they would make these videos, citizens' videos that, that emerged on social media, uh, where they would be saying uh, to somebody who's on the border of Delhi, uh, where's your home? And he'd say Mahoba, uh, or he'd say uh, name a city in Jharkhand or Bihar. And, and, and this city uh, person uh, often would not have heard of a town like that. And they would say, how far is it? And they'd say 500 kilometers, 800 kilometers. Um, 1500 kilometers and we would be hearing this uh, you know sound uh, voice behind the cell phone video saying are you sure you can walk that long how, how far are you going to go and and there'd be this deadpan expression of this desperate person who knew uh, that he had he or she uh, had no choice except to make a run for it to, to find some way and the news that came in, there were, there were people dropping dead on the highways. Uh, there were people who were being stopped by the police and forcibly quarantined. And they were not being allowed to walk uh, on the highways that went along towns because uh, apparently these people were carriers of the virus and barriers had to be put uh, to disallow them. So they were walking along railway tracks. We had uh, the horrific incident where uh, a labor who had started walking from a city in Maharashtra at night uh, went to sleep on the railway track, 17 people, uh, knowing that the trains had been stopped, that there wasn't going to be any traffic, and a lone train came and, uh, uh, you know, o o overnight it, it ran over them, and all we found the next morning were bodies. So um, the, the I mean, what we're going through now is horrific uh, with this oxygen famine that the country is, uh, is kind of undergoing. But the victims of today somehow, while, you know, while it is a crisis of great proportion, they, they still have family. Uh, they're still close to home. What we were witnessing last year, I, I think the, the proportion of it, <clears throat> the scale of the injustice, at that time was far more uh, shocking. And <clears throat> it, this was something that almost everybody in the cities witnessed with their own eye. You know, if you went out at night, <clears throat> uh, despite the lockdown, all you would see was just trails and trails of people walking. So clearly um, the government had announced a lockdown that was not really a lockdown because uh, Indian people were walking on the streets, but what the lockdown had done was make it impossible for them to access any infrastructure. They could not take trains, there were no buses, they could not eat any food, and uh, every day there were road accidents uh, being reported. And uh, we've run out of oxygen today, um, or it's not being supplied at the right time, volunteers are scrambling to get it, that was a time of such helplessness because you couldn't be out on the street. The police were beating you back. 
uh, you, 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 citizens couldn't run trains. And of course, eventually citizens began to run buses. So one of the, 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 the positive thing that began to happen immediately was large numbers of uh, groups organizing themselves to somehow provide relief uh, to the migrants, uh, to the workers, to those stranded, to those uh, who, who had, many of them had nowhere to go. So they were actually stranded in their homes. Many of the domestic workers in our cities were five minutes away from their employer, but they could not any longer walk through the gated uh, colonies uh, that they had serviced for almost yeah. all their lives. Yeah. And they um, began to then depend on citizens' relief packages, and citizens uh, began to organize buses for them. Yeah. And somehow, mm -hmm. one year later, we are in that cycle again, where yeah. uh, they're completely invisible, but they are as desperate as they were last year. Thanks a lot, Natasha. That was uh, really uh, a reminder of what we all saw last year, and it is still as surreal as you've mentioned. Uh, in our imagination and uh, uh, and uh, yes it does raise the question of not just the journeys but also the dignity of the migrants so with that I would like to move on to Mansi and ask her the question because she has also recently submitted a report or commissioned a report with ILO on the on the how the COVID crisis has led to the uh, uh, you know, dilution of the safety nets, perhaps. So, Mansi, can you please uh, step in and uh, uh, tell us, walk us through the work that you are doing with the ILO on this? Well, thanks, thanks, Ritu, and thanks for um, having me here. Um, just a quick uh, introduction. I'm representing Ajivika Bureau today, and we are a labor rights nonprofit that works uh, across Western India in Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan. Um, so last year was, you know, um, as Natasha said, you know, a surreal moment recounting last year's uh, experiences today. Um, but already then, you know, it was, it was a, it was a strange moment for us as an organization, having worked with migrant workers um, for, for the preceding 15 years and seeing, you know, a, a sudden visibility or visibilization of the of of the plight that they were going through and that Nat Natasha has already outlined um, you know broadly i think migrant worker the term has come to have a very perverse relationship with the term lockdown uh, both because of last year and because of what is happening today last year we saw you know uh, people forced to return to villages because of loss of livelihood, lack of food, lack of savings, fear of the disease, fear of the local government. A lot of the you know, different factors came together pushing uh, workers uh, to the return journeys. This year, what we see is that a lot of uh, migrant workers in the communities that we are working in have stayed put because uh, there's a certain fear of uh, the return journey itself becoming uh, um, uh, deadly, as Natasha also uh, pointed out, but also because to some extent, some factories and some economic activity has been, um, you know, uh, not locked down this time. So you have factories, uh, construction sites, anywhere that workers live on site, they are allowed to continue working. So what we see now is that, you know, migrant workers have now also become, in a sense, the reason why a nationwide lockdown cannot be implemented or cannot be called because, you know, then we'll take away their livelihood. Um, even at the risk of keeping them at their work sites where they sleep right next to the, you know, machines that they work throughout the day with no ventilation, with no adequate food. So it's become a kind of uh, weird paradox where we are either going to protect uh, workers' livelihood or we can protect their life and health. And this, this is really you know, strange for us to navigate as an organization because last year we saw people you know, changing occupations, going into street vending, trying to you know, uh, uh, do, de uh, do deliveries because that was uh, the essential workforce required. 
this year they are continuing with their uh, livelihood options but in a in in a confined space with a more infectious disease around and with no options of return right so you have uh, buses and uh, trains working but no tickets available so even though there are some allowance made in terms of policy um, this time around in in the announcement of restrictions and curfews it's not necessarily been from the point of view of migrant workers for migrant workers their association to this whole discussion remains restricted to the economic aspect right that they are poor and in need of livelihood that they are economic actors so they need the economy to stay open hence we cannot uh, call for a you know nationwide lockdown or for stricter measures and the economy needs them because otherwise we'll have a slump and this serves no one right neither does it serve the economy because without generation and demand you know manufacturing units cannot really produce anything even if workers are available on site and it doesn't serve the migrant workers either because they are so much more vulnerable to disease this time around with the uh, virus being more infectious and the answer to both of these is a basic you know one phrase solution which is income security if we provide income security then neither do we have to you know uh, try and prevent workers from leaving as if that's the only kind of you know a role of the government nor do we need to worry about you know whether uh, the economy will revive uh, after the wave is over or not if we have provided for basic survival needs of food healthcare uh access to justice in case of uh, harassment in case of wages being lost in case of accidents if we are able to provide for a basic survival of the migrants then we don't necessarily need to hinge them to the economy's survival to the nation's survival um in any kind of abstract way and another point to note here is the very important role that civil society played in the last lockdown what we see this time around is that much of the middle class also has a high infection rate around them many people are infected so the the same kind of you know uh, access to migrant communities is very difficult uh, mm-hmm. even for civil society organizations that were able to act a lot quicker um, last year so that also shows that you know civil society initiatives while you know were very instrumental last year they are not necessarily the long term solution or the most sustainable solution of protecting migrant workers income livelihood and social protection that needs to come from governments that needs to come from the state that needs to come through robust structures of policy that, that are put into place and for this you know one of our experiences was that you know to not necessarily see migrant workers as people in need only that we need to provide them this or we need to provide them that a lot of the migrant workers from their own communities and did uh, you know ration delivery and ra- ration distribution that uh, civil society was able to you know um, get to their communities and then internally they you know took the leadership in making sure that everyone has uh, basic food for the next two days similarly this time we see at ajivikas um, you know operational areas in the cities that a lot of uh, workers are recording videos of themselves being vaccinated and sharing amongst workers whatsapp groups saying that i'm fine and you know there's no need to uh, be worried about side effects and so on and so forth they're sharing um, and conducting their own kind of awareness uh, campaigns about uh, covid appropriate behavior and how to do home care uh, given that now a lot of people are uh, resorting to home home care in the lack of you know uh, hospital facilities so a lot can be done if associating you know migrants exclusively from this economic characteristic uh, and see them as a community that's resourceful um that that is aware of its rights that would also step up if provided the right uh, support and structures from the state thanks a lot fancy and uh, with this i would like to come to you here uh, let me add you to the spotlight 
Thank you very much. Um, and thank you again also uh, from my side very much for this invitation and uh, to be part of this fascinating conversation. Um, I just thought um, very quickly, because I, I, I know that you have another round of questions as well to go, I just thought very quickly, I would situate as well the, the situation um, and, and the really the tragic situation uh, that we saw in, in India last year. And, and I really do agree with Natasha and Matsi about, you know, I mean, kind of the, 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 that what we're seeing now and, and what we're experiencing now is, is um, it, it's not different. And, you know, it's part of that same trajectory, um, if you will. Um, but but really kind of situating, I guess, India and the situation, they're also in a, a bit the global picture. And the first point that I wanted to make is that the picture of migration in India is very, as you all know, is very complex as well. So we have these large numbers of internal migrants that have been moving, as, as Mansi and Natasha so eloquently kind of, you know, pointed out in terms of their movement from diff between different states back and forth in, in a kind of a seasonal or not so seasonal movement. You also have um, a large number of Indians that, who, who travel abroad to, to work, hence the diaspora. Um, and the, the kinds of works and the sectors of work um, in which they're located also, um, you know, kind of is an indicator for some of the vulnerability that, that uh, Indians, Indian migrants abroad kind of face. Um, and have faced in the context of the pandemic. You also though have within India, um, and, and I would I just wanted to pull them out for a little bit and, and to focus on them in a bit. Um, migrants from other parts of particularly South Asia, uh, but also other parts of, of the world of, of Asia that either are in refugee communities, so you know refugees for instance from Myanmar, or uh, migrant worker communities um, from Nepal or Bangladesh, many of whom don't have a regular status um, for, for all sorts of reasons in, in India. And I think it's worth kind of spending, you know, some time to think about the particular vulnerabilities as well that, that non-citizens within this, this kind of horrific context of uh, deprivation and destitution um, uh, face as, as the, the pandemic rolled out. So of course, um, there were, you know, I mean, the, the, the kinds of uh, issues that were raised in India also about kind of using public emergencies as a way for governments to curtail rights. And this is something that we've seen kind of throughout um, this region and, and in, in other regions of the world where, the, the, where the, the legitimate kind of curtailment of some rights under international human rights standards where public emergencies do give governments the ability um, to, to, to kind of fine tune some of their um, uh, rights obligations and how they uphold them it was taken too far so the fact that you know in public emergencies um, you are um, un under human rights law you have a very strictly limited conditions uh, under which you can cut your rights for the shortest possible, possible amount of time without any discrimination and um, you know where fundamental rights are not allowed to be abrogated and and these were these were um played around with, let's say, and, and, and in, you know, in other parts of the world, freedom of expression, for instance, has been you know, particularly under uh, threat um, as a result of COVID measures, but also things like, you know, kind of uh, borders that have been closed, um, even to people that are fleeing violence um, and, and fleeing for their lives, again, on the context and the pretext of, of COVID. And what I found quite interesting, um, you know, when you talked about quarantine um, and how quarantine impacted, because on the one hand, yes, it is an essential public health measure. On the other hand, both here in India and in other parts of the region, we see quarantine operating very much as a detention, uh, very much as a stigmatization. Um, so in some parts of, of South Asia, for instance, you see migrant communities that are subject to a different kind of quarantine than non-migrant communities, you know, where it seems being physically isolated, being placed in, in almost ghettos and the stigma that arises from that. So the, the, the kinds of measures that have been taken as well to, to respond uh, to the public health emergency had a very different impact on people depending on their nationality or their legal status in the country. Um, or, or the particular sectors that they, they worked in um, and or the, where they lived. Um, I just wanted to focus before I finish just a little bit on, on healthcare and the right to health, because I think the, the concern around um, access to migrants in these situations of vulnerability, as Marcy and, and Natasha have, have told us, 
is is very important. Um, and as I said, you know, I mean that vulnerability can relate to that invisibility, that precariousness of, of work or living situ status, um, but also if you're undocumented. And, and and also for a lot of people, if they're in detention, um, and we had a, a, a lot of concern around, you know, uh, the, the spread of the virus in things like immigration detention centers where you're not able to uh, practice uh, physical distancing. And, and of course, people that are uh, particularly migrant workers, for instance, that have lost um, their employment as a result of COVID. Uh, and I can think about my Indian migrant worker communities in the Gulf, for instance, um, that were faced with exactly this situation, losing in access to employment, and therefore the residence and the work permit, um, the regular status that they had in these countries, and being subject to uh, detention and forced deportation. So I think one of the other kind of questions that, that we've been asking in the context of the, the, the pandemic is, what does reintegration look like? And I think that can be asked for in, internal migrants as well. You know, what does reintegration look like for people uh, where the government realizes that they have to come home? Now, um, there was questions around the ways in which you know, migrants were forcibly deported um, to South Asia from the Gulf, for instance, and the large numbers of people that were returning would these quite fragile health systems be able to cope with people with this kind of amount of people coming back? Would they be included in, in health systems if they were not regularly resident and were being forcibly deported back, et cetera? But also, as, as, as Marcy, as you pointed out, you know, what social protection measures are there? What, what can we expect returnees to, to have access to? And what do alternative livelihood options um, kind of look like when people have moved from one place to the other? So I think these are all kind of, in a way, you know, kind of questions that needed to be answered in the course of, of last year and coming to here. I mean, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult in the context of the crisis to say, okay, like now think about this while you're trying to keep, you know, your citizens alive. But really it is, it's about kind of thinking through some of these very important governance um, issues. The last the thing I will end on is, vaccines. And I know obviously this is a live conversation for everybody um, you know, in, around the world pretty much um, in, this, in this region, um, you know, more than most in a certain way, because it's about equality of access to vaccines. And, and you know, I'm glad to hear that mm, domestic migrant workers, internal migrant workers are able to get access to vaccines. The concern is that those that do not have status in, in India, those that are undocumented or in refugee communities, um, and uh, uh, other kind of you know, communities that may be in fact citizens but aren't able to prove it. How do you ensure that um, everybody, this idea that you know, nobody is safe till everybody is safe, how do you really put that into practice without when you're in a situation of, of reduced vaccine um, access, we see this all over Asia, how do you ensure um, that um, you meaningfully integrate people into a vaccine rollout when by raising their heads above the wall by saying actually I don't have the status they are risking detention and deportation and in fact the loss of their livelihood you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think it is important while at the same time as Nancy pointed out we don't see migrants just as economic actors we see them as people that, who have very often been at the front line of, of, of our response to, to this virus um, how do you ensure that they are in included in our communities and I'll come back to this idea of you know are we, are we talking about workers are we talking about people you know and, and governments often kind of think that these are absolutely two different categories but I'll stop there thank you. Thanks a lot uh, Pia for this very valuable intervention from your side. Uh, I wanted to ask because I know keeping in mind the time uh, that if somebody has a question and I already see Snehal's hand going up so I would, uh, and also Anu's, and I would let them to ask the question very briefly uh, so that uh, the participants can answer them in the time. So thank you, Sneha. So I actually, I had a question, but Pia tried to, Pia herself brought it up in the last part of her, um, of her talk. So uh, about vaccines. So you highlighted the problem. And my question about uh, on that was how, how can we tackle it? Uh, I was going to ask, for example, uh, for like under international human rights law, what can we do for migrants, for global migrants, and even in domestic law in India? What can we do? As in, so the situation here right now is that no matter who you are, 
if you have a if you have loads of money if you have access to everything people are still dying so migrants refugees stateless people they are so extremely vulnerable people and so i i i just have that question what what should we do in the future where people most of them would be dead but those who survive how should we ensure their protection so uh, if you could answer that i i'm not sure if we would be able to answer it right now uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty but still like what is the way thanks uh, sneha for that question if i may add the uh, that uh, remark that you made about the people and the migrant not being so different as two categories if you can also perhaps reflect a little bit on that while answering this that would be really useful just very quickly because i'm sure that natasha and mansi you know kind of have more kind of operational you know on the ground <laughs> wisdom on this from a international human rights law perspective the the issue is of discrimination and so you don't treat like unlike um the the policy guidance issue um, as you point out because we're not in a situation and then well no country in, in in this part of the world is in that situation of luxury to say we've got enough we've got surplus you know who goes first well we'll just decide kind of thing the the point is that prioritization has been made um in a public health context about who should have access to this vaccine depending on their um vulnerability depending you know which age sector of work kind of um and and all these other issues the point should be that that should be regardless of income it should be regardless of your legal status it should be and and there should be uh, you know in the in a way it's like the firewalls and uh, discussion that we have with undocumented migrants to say undocumented migrants will not come to a, a, a hospital to seek public health if they think they're going to be um uh de detained or deported similarly with internal migrants if they think there's going to be a penalization or a penalty applied to them um if they if they seek a vaccine then they're not going to get it so i think for me the public health i mean the public health and the the human rights arguments are are quite similar the challenge is when you're in the situation of um of 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 lack of plenty when you are in a situation in our countries where uh um, there is an expectation that if you are at a certain point of the socioeconomic ladder that you come first rather than maybe last because you're not in as great need this is where the challenges um occur but but i think that you know the policy is is relatively um it's not that hard to work out thanks a lot priya i want to ask if mansi and natasha would like to add something to this natasha yeah. you need to make sure yeah i i i i just want to uh you know talk about the elephant in the room uh we're talking about policy and uh, you know it's a very important conversation to have we all been trained to think like this but the reality that we are living through is not that there's a paucity of vaccines not that there's a paucity of oxygen not that there is uh a virulent strain that is killing off most indians but that we have a government that is deliberately uh has allowed uh, super spreader events to take place throughout the country not one not two uh but many the kumbh mela was continuing while people in delhi were dying counting and polling in uttar pradesh and west bengal the most densely populated states of this country and in uttar pradesh these were gram panchayat elections the least urgent considering that the you know the day after you had you know within 10 days of these super spreader events you have villages that have got 70% corona positive people so there is so much deliberate um um almost malicious uh, neglect from the perspective of the government in the in in this current situation that that i mean that's really the the biggest barrier at the moment 
you know, why do why do we have a vaccine shortage in this country? We would even, you know, even if we did everything right, there would not be enough vaccines to vaccinate everybody within the week in this country. But here we have news reports. We have the CEO of the Serum Institute leaving the country, going to London, and then talking to the media and saying the government of India has not even placed an order. So how am I going to deliver? How, how are we going to manufacture when they have not even placed an order big enough to be able to uh, fill up the, uh, you know, the, the, the vaccine centers? So um, oxygen, um, oximeters, concentrators, Delhi airport right now, there is a glut. Planes have arrived from multiple countries. Governments have sent, uh, you know, Germany has sent uh, equipment. The US has sent e equipment. Five I think we had a connection issue with Natasha. Oh, you're back now, Natasha. Sorry. We lost you in the last little bit. So, so those are the absolute urgent uh, things that need to be addressed and they are being addressed to some extent by citizens themselves, by uh, volunteers from the opposition parties, uh, by, by uh, you know, people who have themselves stepped in to say, we will organize uh, oxygen camps, we will buy uh, oxygen cylinders, we will distribute concentrators, we are uh, importing. Um, I, I know any number of people in Delhi who are getting together to import concentrators from China to be able to distribute among uh, the poor and homeless uh, in this country. So we, we, we are really looking at a, uh, you know, a, a man-made barrier right now. There, there, there's an artificial scarcity that's been created. Um, just Thank as a you last time, somebody was saying all of this seems to have brought down hate crimes in India. And then we thought about it and we said, well, this looks like a hate crime against the entire population. Thank you. What else Thanks is a lot, Natasha. Actually, we, we also had a conversation earlier with the Jayati, which is pre-recorded and will be played in the summit itself. And we had the same concern in that uh, conversation that this entire scarcity is artificially made by a very cruel government. So there is no denial to that fact in, in amongst a lot of us uh, also outside of India. I believe. Um, Mansi, would you like to intervene and perhaps give your opinion on it? Yeah. yeah, I completely agree with the Pia and Natasha about you know both the artificial scarcity that has been created, as well as a certain you know um, a, a certain fear amongst people who don't have quote unquote the right documents. Even amongst internal migrants, we saw that you know. People were very skeptical in participating in any kind of registration exercise um, that was being taken um, taken up even by local civic governments uh, during the last lockdown to distribute, you know, food, etc. Because they thought that that might be misused uh, for all kinds of other, you know, uh, malicious uh, purposes. So there's definitely this this focus of the government and the policy uh, aspect on registration and documentation and data that somehow if we have all of that, then all these problems would go away. And paradoxically, that is what we don't need. That is what the workers don't need. They don't want to be over enumerated in 20,000 different registered by the municipal state and central government what they want is simple provisioning simple uh, access to their hard hard fought you know livelihood and skills so there's a certain uh, you know absence of uh, recognition that these are workers or these are uh, people who have made a lot of investment in 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 certain communities by developing skills all on their own um, so by just seeing them as you know pegs in a in a certain um, in a, in a machine or in a in, in the smooth functioning of the city, we kind of miss that point. With respect to vaccines, 
uh, completely agree with the, uh, what Natasha said that the scarcity is not, uh, you know, uh, that the scarcity is artificial and it has been compounded by uh, the complete lack of awareness and communication about what the vaccine does. This should be everywhere in India. We should have hoardings everywhere, but we don't see anything um, explaining what, uh, what the vaccines do, how, how one is supposed to get access to a vaccine. The current system is app-based, which uh, automatically excludes so many uh, people. And now it has also been privatized about uh, the age of 18 and until 44 which is also ironically the, the largest group of migrant workers tend to be in this age group, 18 to 44. It's only the skilled workers that are, you know, often uh, the skilled masters that are above 45. So what we saw in our research was that, um, you know, in a place like Surat, where you have a lot of power loom workers, a lot of these ma garment masters went and got themselves vaccinated because they saw the functioning of the unit being, you know, really dependent on their... Um, skill, expertise, and supervision that they cannot abandon their workers. They have to get vaccinated and be available for them. But now that it's uh, opened up for the younger population, they do not have the access to the free vaccines. At the same time, they do not have access to a paid leave to go and queue up and get vaccinated. They do not have access to a sick leave in case they get uh, side effects of a slight fever. So what is often also, you know, brushed aside as vaccine hesitancy because certain people don't believe in quote unquote science, we, we found from our, you know, field research that that's not the case. It's the lack of a simple paid leave that is not uh, giving people the confidence that if I go and get vaccinated today and I'm a bit weak tomorrow, I might lose my job, I might get replaced. Uh, so it could easily be fixed by, you know, simple announcements, communication campaigns that people getting vaccinated um, should be given one or two days uh, off. At the same time, you know, the legal and labor infrastructure, labor law infrastructure is, is so perverse. To give an example, in Mumbai, where we also have a, a, a resource center, over, over many decades, we've seen you know, informalization of manufacturing units. So you had the big textile factories and the big uh, manufacturing factories in Mumbai in the, uh, up, up until the late 20th century that started uh, closing down and becoming informalized because that way you can you know, circumvent labor protections and uh, social security obligations. So what we saw is the move of uh, factory work to the slums where then they get um, different parts of the assembly line are, are you know, scattered across, across a slum. And in this case, you know, the registration of the unit is not under the Factories Act, but under the Shops and Establishments Act, because you're just operating a small shop with 10 workers or less. Now, this was done to make labor cheap, to make production cheap. And what we see right now under the lo new lockdown lines, uh, lockdown guidelines in Mumbai, is that factories are allowed to operate, but these small manufacturing units that were forced to move to small shops are not allowed to operate because legally they are shops and not factories. So it creates this very perverse you know, relationship, as I was saying before, to lockdown, to certain guidelines, to fines and penalties that can, that can really easily be avoided if we do not get into these uh, categories and not accept and recognize that we have created this situation in the first place, not just last year, but over the many preceding years and uh, even decades. Thank you much, uh, Mansi, for that intervention. And uh, I am being mindful of the time. We have only 10 minutes left for this uh, panel. Can I ask my question? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I will come back to India, you know, and where we have uh, we have seen that um, there have been serious questions raised regarding the Bharat Biotech co vaccine, you know, by doctors, by medical associations, and we later also saw that government uh, officials or ministers, you know, and claimed 
that the vaccine is 120% safe or efficient, the 200%, you know, such lavish figures. And the government now also admits that people who got vaccines were also positive, you know, and there's a sizable number of people. So don't you think there's this chaos, of course, but if people are not... I, know, sorry, uh, I would like you to keep the questions concerning migration itself and not on the vaccine. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Because the vaccine was raised, uh, you know. So no, the but uh, the panel is on migration. So if, if you have a question on migration, then. Yeah, okay. So I will link how do the migrants should look at this chaos, you know. Uh, that's, that's one point. Thank you. Anyone? Richard, could I, 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 I don't, I won't pretend to be able to answer the, the question very much, except to say that my, um, one of the things that I did want to, to raise, um, and I think it, it comes part of, of the, the whole issue is gov of governance, um, is how migration is governed. Um, and, and I know that, you know, that, that there's, um, the, the global compact for migration, which was being talked about. And, and I should say, um, you know, maybe as one of the takeaways of this, of this conversation is that the government of India did not participate very actively at all in the recent yes. regional review, the first regional review of the global compact for migration, which took place in March and has not entered a voluntary survey, um, has not answered the voluntary survey about its implementation um, of the GCM. So that's something that, you know, could probably be um, encouraged as a result of, of this uh, discussion. But I just wanted to come back to this idea, and I think it, it comes to the question as well as like, you know, where do migrants sit in the, the, the ecosystem of who gets access to vaccines, et cetera. Is this idea that um, COVID just revealed a lot of the structural inequalities, the structural violence, I would say, that the global governance of migration has um, had for a long time. The fact that governments make kind of choices um, is, does not mean that all of these are rational choices. And it's quite akin to this idea that, you know, well, migrants, you know, this whole vaccine hesitancy thing, Mansi, that you were saying, well, migrants, you know, make these irrational choices because they decide to do this and they're being led by criminals or they're being misinformed or whatever. Governments make pretty irrational choices in terms of their migration policy. And coming back to why they do that is probably part of that hate speech discussion. But, you know, where you prefer temporary over permanent migration. Now, there may not be a good labor market reason for that, but that's what you do. You prefer closed borders over regular pathways. Again, there may not be a good societal reason for that. You prefer high skilled over low skilled, even though there may not be a, you know, a, a, a labor market reason for that again. And I think one of the things that we can do that the, the, the pandemic allows us possibly to do is reimagine human mobility um, you know, in the context um, of, of the pandemic, just because it has impacted human, human mobility in such desperate ways and our mobility as well, right? I mean, you know, I'm kind of been here in closed borders for ages. The idea of this permanent temporariness, and I say that as well for the for the internal migrant workers, um, but I'm thinking also of, you know, for instance, um, temporary migrant workers in the Gulf or even in the EU, where you have this permanent, this idea that you don't permanently don't need access to some of your rights. You permanently don't need access to, you know, kind of a, a functioning healthcare system. You permanently don't need access to your right to family. You permanently don't need access to good healthcare um, or adequate housing. Um, and that we allow these systems of governance of migration to continue for a certain group of people because it's convenient, as you said, Nancy, because we see them as economic actors and not as people. And I think it's those kinds of questions that, you know, I mean, governments need to start being asked questions about how they see their citizens um, that are on the move and what kinds of measures of protection they're really going to put in place. And I don't think tinkering around the edges is necessarily going, yes, I agree, absolutely. You know, doing the, the easy, um, the, the things that can be fixed at the local level, absolutely we must do. But I think we have to ask the bigger questions about what we mean when we mean, when we look at human mobility, because otherwise we're going to be left in this situation where our communities are suffering from the fact that you have permanently temporary people in them. And not because of those temporary people, but because of the situation that has been created from this sense of dislocation and the scapegoating that is going on of migrants and foreigners and people that are seen as foreigners about this disease that has been, you know, taken place for, for such a long time with other elements of othering 
um, that are going on. So I do think we need to think a little bit more deeply about you know, mobility in the context of our societies and what we want our societies to look like for ourselves and our children. Stop uh, thanks a lot, Pia, for that intervention. It was really, really needed. And I wanted to add over here, uh, coming from your intervention itself, that I remember having a discussion with the Minister of Migration in Netherlands once a uh, couple of years ago. And I asked him a simple question that when I take a European nationality, I still do not, in a lot of Western European countries, I still do not have the right to equal Fa like equal family rights as a, my Dutch counterpart or German counterpart might have because I cannot bring my parents from India or otherwise to the Western European countries. And which is something that now we are seeing in a massive scale amongst the transnational families that they're worried, they are, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are facing this huge emotional pain. Um, with their families in India or other other places in the world, and they cannot bring them to the Western Europe. Uh, and it and the answer to that question uh, from the minister to me was very economically centered. That our society needs you as a high skilled migrant, but not your sick, ailing parents. And this is something that we absolutely need to break past. And I hope that we will be forcefully able to stand up to it even in the EU-India conversation that we are having um, in the summit and afterwards. So with this, I would like to thank all of you for joining us in this panel and for your really important intervention. Um, as organizers, our goal is to, as what Alina said in the beginning of this conversation, our goal is to prepare a document, document for which we can use to work with uh, the European Parliament and the uh, and the progressive leaders across uh, the Western Europe specifically, and uh, uh, hopefully set these agendas for the next conversations between the Europe and India relations. So with this, I would like to end this panel today and thank you once again for being here with us. Thank you.